What's going on? Welcome into the Matt Bernier Show, part of the In The Money Media Network. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bernier underscore Matt. Today is Monday, July the 26th, 2021. It is episode 75. However you listen, thank you for doing so. Many ways to find the podcast. If you're someone who listens just to the audio version, you have Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and themoneypodcast.com, just to name a few. If you are someone who watches along over on YouTube, then this is probably a good week to do so because we're going to dive into some handicapping in a little bit. Search bar, Matt Burner, your show. You'll get this episode along with the 74 prior before we get uh, go into all the details of, of what's to come for this week's show. Um, some sad news. I was off uh, vacation Last week, and I found out uh, a guest of the show, Jack Fain, uh, had passed away. Uh, a member of his family reached out to me to pass along that information. Um, thoughts are, are with everyone involved, uh, family members and friends of Jack's. And again, he was a um, just a, a great guy from what I was able to chat with him when he came on the show a couple times. And um, I, the, I thought it was fitting the to sign off of the email I got from the family member. So Jack is now eternally in the winner's circle, and I, I think we can all appreciate that. So uh, thoughts are with Jack Fain's family. R.I.P. Jack. Um, for this week, content-wise, there are a lot of moving pieces right now in the world of, of thoroughbred horse racing. You have horses that are defecting, horses that are moving from one place to another, one track to another. So I'm not going to really do a deep dive into the classic or any of those sort of divisions just because I think this week there's a lot that's going to go on that could pretty dramatically alter sort of the way we we interpret these divisions with the Jim Dandy coming up on Saturday afternoon at Saratoga. We found out earlier this week or I guess late on Sunday evening that Hot Rod Charlie is going to bypass the Pacific Classic. The next start is TBD. I've theorized that it's probably, I don't want to say probably, theorized that it could be the Pennsylvania Derby. Uh, for straight three-year-olds as opposed to a race that I hadn't even thought of. Uh, but the awesome, again, also does make some sense. That is against older horses, and it's at home, as opposed to having to ship out to the East Coast again. But Hot Rod Charlie won't be taking on elders at Del Mar. So with that move, we'll find out what happens in the Jim Dandy. And I, I think a really interesting race. And no, it may not be the most productive race long-term, or it hasn't been to this point, but one of two races that I'm going to handicap here in this show this week uh, is the ninth at Saratoga on Friday, and that will work as this week's Friday feature. Uh, it is the Curlin Stakes, mile and an eighth main track for three-year-olds. It's a race that is restricted to horses who have not won a graded sweepstakes over a mile in 2021, and that's why a horse like First Captain is eligible for this race, because his graded stakes win came at a flat mile at Belmont Park. This is a really interesting race, and I think there are horses who could factor into the division later on in the year. It could also end up being really nice four-year-olds and older horses. So this is one of the races we'll go over, but before that, we'll dive into the Wednesday feature up at the spot. That's race number nine, the grade two honorable miss for, th for older. Phillies and mares going six furlongs on the main track. I think that's a really intriguing race, and we'll dive into that. We'll take a look at some past performances, not only the past performances that I have marked up, but I'll also go back and we'll take a look at DRS Formulator product and I'll show you the actual notes that I've written in because um, that's kind of the way that I've gone about doing things recently from a handicapping standpoint. I'll go through, make up all my marks where in the past I would go through and take all my notes first and then upload or download the PPs and then mark them up. I've actually started working the opposite way, um, just a little I don't know, a little quirk of the way that I've gone about my handicapping. So those will be the two big pieces that we'll dive into this week. Uh, we'll also take a look. I know it's only been two weeks, but I think you can start to glean some information as far as the track tendencies, the profile up at Saratoga. And I'm not going to do a deep dive into Del Mar right now. We'll, we'll get into that in the next few weeks as we get closer and closer to the Pacific Classic. But um, I thought this was a good week racing-wise up at Saratoga. I feel like the weather, yeah, a little bit of an unknown, but let's be honest, it's a little bit of an unknown every day up at the spa this time of year. So we'll go over the 9th at Saratoga on Wednesday. We'll go over the 9th at Saratoga on Friday, which will serve as this week's Friday feature. If you want to be on the show next week, as the person who gets to decide what the Friday feature is, you need to leave your selection for the Colonel and Stakes Beneath the Video Player on YouTube. If you are correct, I will contact you and we'll set something up for next Monday. But without further ado, let's get into taking a look at some of the tendencies so far at the 2021 Saratoga meeting. And we'll transition into some handicapping. Take a look at some past performances for the Honorable Miss and the Colonel and Stakes. 
All right, before we get into the honorable miss, this is a bit of a track profile so far for the 2021 Saratoga meeting. And I recognize it's not the most uh, comprehensive, but you have to keep in mind, we've only got about two weeks worth of data. And I think an important thing for those of you who have maybe never done a track profile in the past, or you've thought about it and you just haven't done it, or maybe you do it yourself. I would strongly encourage you not to use uh, races that are at the lower levels and maiden races. I also go to the point, and uh, this was in uh, predominantly from Brohammer's book, Modern Pace Handicapping, uh, the idea of not wanting to use two-year-old races. And I still don't use three-year-old races. I'll start to incorporate three-year-old restricted races after both Saratoga and Del Mar. I kind of look at that as like the, basically to me, the breaking point of, okay, well now you, now you could in all likelihood take on older horses over the next handful of months. I'm going to start to incorporate you into some of these things. You were a little bit more mature and a little bit more relatable and reliable, I should say, than you were maybe early on as a three-year-old. So those are some of the parameters, no two-year-olds, no maiden races, none of the bottom level races, uh, and I'm not going to use three-year-olds until after we get out of the Saratoga and Del Mar meets. I go through, you can group these in different ways. This is just the way that I feel is best suited. Uh, everyone's open to their own interpretation of what they think grouping should be for distances and things like that. As you can see, I have the date, the race, the entrance, the odds of the winner, uh, where the temporary rail was set if it was run on grass. I have six furlong races, six and a half and seven furlong races grouped together, uh, eight to nine furlong races, and then nine and a half or greater on the main track. Then you have different turf settings as well for the both the inner turf and the main turf course or the outer turf, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, I have five and a half, five furlongs, uh, eight furlongs in the inner, eight and a half to nine on the inner, uh, and then greater than nine and a half. And the same goes for the outer. So what information, if any, can you use and, and perhaps kind of sink your teeth into at this point, keeping in mind that you have the first call and the second call, the first call in sprint races is going to be a quarter of a mile into the race. The second call will be half mile into the race. And in route races, the first call will be a half mile into the race. The second call will be three quarters of a mile into the race. Uh, so what can we, what can you glean from this? What can we kind of use to our advantage going forward? Uh, and know that, know that a lot of people do this, but you'd be surprised at how many people don't do this sort of thing. And I think it just really goes a long way into trying to truly factor in the likelihood of certain horses winning. And also perhaps spotting some shorter prices who may be a little bit compromised given the way the track has been playing. And it doesn't mean that it's always going to play this way. You need to be sort of fluid with this. You need to be able to be flexible because this isn't just, you know, gospel. It's going to change from time to time. And it's up to you as the handicapper to be in tune with when it's changing. You can see that the six furlong and under races on the main track, they have been very kind to speed. Right now, this is set for, let's call this less than a half length off of the pace on average of the races that I've used. And uh, all told, it's roughly, if I'm eyeballing it, about nine races. So again, very limited sample size, but a sample size nonetheless. Uh, just under a half length a quarter mile into the race at first call. I think that's where you've seen most of your good running happen. Uh, and then half mile into it, you're actually poking a, a nose in front. Uh, but there are instances where you can come from a little bit farther off of it. The sixth race, excuse me, the second race uh, yesterday on Sunday, you had horse rally from a little bit farther off of it. Uh, the fourth race had horses rally from a little bit farther off of it. Keeping in mind that this is, it's just a snapshot of how the, the track is playing, but you can, I think, see some, some factors and some, some pieces that you may want to use and incorporate into your handicapping. So basically, long-winded way of saying dirt sprints, six furlongs and shorter, you want to be right up on the chooch. You want to be really close to the engine. You want to be making sure that you're not having to rally from 100 out of it, because if you are, you better be damn good not really breaking any news there. That's kind of how this whole thing works as far as dirt racing is concerned. Six and a half to seven furlongs though, it's a little bit of a different story. You have horses who have been able to rally from farther off of it and still be effective as opposed to the six furlongs. And it may not sound like a big difference. We're dealing with 
a 16th to an eighth of a mile difference between the six and under and potentially the six and a half and sevens, but it just plays differently. And it goes to show that not all, not all sprints are created equal. You need to be able to go through and, and decipher what's going to be important and what style will play at certain configurations compared to others. Eight to nine furlongs. I think this is the thing that many people, uh, I, I don't know if it's quite as, I don't want to say bad, bad's not the right phrasing. I think more people are in tune to the fact that long distance racing is just as conducive to speed types, if not more so than the shorter races are. And it's because these horses seem, tend to carry their speed a little bit more or a little bit better than uh, maybe many people would tend to think these races so far at a mile and an eighth. And that's what these are based off of. Keep in mind the eight and nine furlongs, I have a template set up and I just kind of tweak it based on what races are offered or configurations are offered at each track nine furlongs we know that there are no mile races on dirt at saratoga these are nine furlong races on the main track and typically you want to be pretty close to it you don't have to be on the lead but you want to be reasonably close where you don't have too much work to do and granted you can still rally if the pace is off the charts but to this point you want to be a little bit closer uh for being honest probably within about a length or so I don't know that you want to be too much farther back than that when you're going a route of ground on the main track right now. As far as the turf courses are concerned, this is going to be very difficult to truly kind of make any kind of determinations because the samples are even smaller than the main track. Uh, for those of you watching along on YouTube, you can see the biggest sample size right now is probably from the five, five and a half furlong turf sprints. Um, there are five races to pull from. I think the most interesting thing is it's not all just speeds. It's horses that are relatively close. Uh, maybe let's call it in stalking position, but even on a couple of occasions, let's say mid pack, if you're going that short distance that can rally from off of it. So um, I think that's something that you want to factor in that you don't absolutely have to have the lead still maintain. You probably want to be closer in turf sprints than you do coming from farther off of it. But um, it, it's worth noting that you, it's not absolutely, you know, imperative that you're a speed type in order to win on the turf thus far at Saratoga going that five, five and a half for a long distance. So what does this mean for this week's races, the races that we're going to go over? Let's start with the Wednesday feature, the grade two honorable miss. Now I'm going to show you, we're going to go back and forth between the DRF formulator product and the past performances that I have marked up. Uh, and the reason is just to show you kind of for those of you who are new to the way that I handicap or if you haven't seen any of these things in the past just to show you what a note looks like um, when I go through and take one kind of the shorthand that's involved with that and maybe it'll make your life a little bit easier uh, so from a past performance standpoint usually how I go about these things upper right hand corner of the first page of whatever race it is I will use or I will write in the time form us pace projector this is clearly before scratches. We have no idea who or who who will or won't go in this race. There's also a horse who figures prominently who may not go in the race. It's been reported that she may bypass the spot for a softer spot down the road. We'll talk about that in a bit. But as you can see, they have the three out on the front, the seven in behind, the one, the eight, the two, and the four. Now, I'll go through, and typically my MO is to take a look at the speeds and go kind of from front to back and say, okay, well, who's going to be positioned where? How many of these speeds are dependent on the lead? How many of them can be forward, but don't absolutely have to have things go their way? And then I'll go through and start to look at the form of some of their most recent races, because while I don't think the most recent race is absolutely the indicator of what you're going to get in this race, I do think it goes a long way into giving you an indication of where they are from a form standpoint. So Ain't No Elmer's the number one horse. Oh, by the way, this race is also littered with girls that I have just, for whatever reason, I think this is a, a piece to remember. When you see horses early on in their career do things and you think that they're going to be good, don't immediately get off the wagon if they have a, a couple of stumbles or they don't run to the way that you necessarily think they're capable of or could be capable of. This race is littered with fillies and mares that I loved early on. And for whatever reason, I said, ah, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe they're just not as good as I thought they were. And lo and behold, they're actually pretty damn good because they're in graded stakes races at Saratoga. So Ain't No Elmers is one of those. I remember seeing her early on last year thinking, this is a pretty talented filly. You can even see this was one of my notes that I had written in from way back when, when she debuted down at the fairgrounds. I think she's pretty good. 
Well, and then she comes back and the two turn race. I don't want to hold that against her. And then the dog would graded stakes. She went fast and kind of faded, but then it still felt like she was trying to find her way. They tried the turf with her. And then I think this year she got out of the gates, just kind of on the clunky side in the most recent run at Churchill Downs. Bang. She pops a 96 buyer. Now, Yes, she defeated Cinnabunny comfortably, who came back and won next out with an 84 buyer. But it must be stated, and I'll go back to the note that I made in Formulator. She had the easiest of leads. She did go fast. But according to Timeform US, that track must have been playing exceptionally fast because despite the fact that she went 21 and 2 and in that 44 range for the opening half, they have the splits color coded blue, meaning that. It was a relatively soft pace. And for her to be able to get out there by herself, I think it was the perfect storm. Horses are going to run their fastest races when they're allowed to do things on the front end comfortably within themselves. I don't think you're going to get a faster race than that. And I think she's going to have company on the front end. That's why I made Ain't No Elmers from a value line standpoint. I made her 10 to 1. She's 6 to 1 on David Aragona's morning line. And I know it says she was entered at Colonial on Monday. She didn't run there. So they're going to run at Saratoga, or I shouldn't say that. Assume they're going to run at Saratoga unless we hear otherwise on Wednesday. We go to the number two. It's Reagan's Edge. Now you're going to see a lot more markings, a lot more, many more markings, better English, on this past performance or this page than you did with Ain't No Elmers. Uh, you'll note that I have these bold lines basically indicating, and you can already see there are the layoff lines there, but I, I really bolden them. And then you take a look and see their first start off of that layoff, the numbers that they've earned and the way that they have run. And then the subsequent start, because in both of her lengthy layoffs, she came back and ran considerably better second start back. Cherie DeVoe brings her back in the N2X at Churchill on June 24th. She's trying to rally into a slow pace, doesn't work. I thought it was an inoffensive race, and that's how I have it written in my notes. But if she takes that step forward that she has shown that she typically does, and she gets back up into that low 90 range with what could be a fast pace, I think she's a little interesting at a number. I would not take her at the 6-1 to one morning line. I made her 10-1. to one. And 10-1, to one, if we're being honest, it, that is not a, a strong push. That is saying, I think she's got a chance in here. I'm not going to you know, mortgage the house to make a bet on her, but I think she's got a chance. Maybe she's one that you play with a little bit in exotics. Maybe if she is in that 10, 12 to one range, she gets a flyer win bet. Not a big bet, but a flyer win bet. Because I do think she has a chance. You'll also note that I have written in she, the winner, Jungle Juice came back. And I'm sure many people, if you just do the, the bare bones in Formulator, you'll pull it up and say, oh, she came back and finished sixth in her next start. Well, there's more to that story. She finished six, but she dumped her rider at the start. So draw a line through it. So we don't have anything really to go off of from that June 24th race at Churchill just yet. We can scroll down here and taking a look. I said she was off a little bit slow. She was toward the rear, uh, just kind of waited, by, uh, bought some time. She tipped out, finished with some interest, inoffensive race on the whole. I think she'll move forward. The question is, how much? Now, the three Sadie lady for Rob Atris is really the – one of the keys to the race, because she is the horse who may not run in this race on Wednesday. They may wait for a New York bread race. Her game is speed. And again, you'll take a look at this note. Easily cleared to the front. Could not have been any easier. Rolled in hand. She shortened up a little bit late. You know, the other fillies and mares made a run at her at the end, but she had already done, done the job. She had already basically put them to bed. She went fast, but she was uncontested doing so. If she goes in this race on Wednesday... She's going to go fast again, but she's going to have company and not just from Ain't No Elmer's down on the inside. Uh, you'll also note in my marked up past performances that I've shown that she has paired up her career by her tops of 85. And any of you who have listened to this pod for any length of time, even back when I was doing it for the racing form, you'll note that I think this precedes or can, or can be an indicator of a forward move upcoming. The reason I don't believe that with this mare is because A, she's five years old, B, she's run 20 times, and C, you can see the highlighted piece that her last four starts, she has earned buyers of 83, 84, 85, 85. I don't look at that and think she's going to jump up to a mid-90 all of a sudden. I feel like at this point, 
in her career. We kind of know what she is. She's fast. I don't know if she's quite good enough to run with some of the girls in this spot. So I understand why the connections are thinking about bypassing and going to a softer, more reasonable spot. It's also worth noting the, the field that she ran against in that dance and Renee has just been dreadful. Runner up came back and earned a 70. The third place finisher a 64. The fifth place finisher a 60. I made her 10 to one just because of the speed. I don't think you can totally dismiss it, but if she doesn't go here, we're going to need to go through and kind of, you know, tweak the line a little bit because there'll be nine points out there that need to be allotted to different horses. So Sadie Lady, pace factor, certainly. She plays a major role in this race, in my opinion. The number four is Lake Avenue for Bill Mott. This is another one of the girls that early on, I was like, she is going to be very good. And she just, for whatever reason, has not put it together. Uh, but having said that, she hasn't run poorly. She is a stakes winner. She's great at stakes place. She's actually a great in stakes winner. She did so at a mile and an eighth as a two-year-old. The, the better rose is when I first went back and watched it. I was disappointed that she didn't win. Because as you'll see from my note here in Formulator, she shot up the wood one-two path, made the lead, and flattened late. She, yes, she flattened out at the end. But in hindsight, when I watched the race a little bit more, she had a perfect trip, but she put the other speeds away. That is the most important part for me because in the grand scheme of things, the other speed horses weren't really all that close to her when it was all said and done. And Estilo Talentoso rallied farthest on the outside from well off the pace and just was able to get her. That was at seven furlongs. To be honest, I have no idea if six furlongs is going to work. I don't know what her game is right now. She wanted a mile and an eighth. She's run well at two turns. She's a stakes winner at a one turn mile. You know, six might be a little bit on the sharp side. But I do think she's interesting when you take a look and see the form of the race coming out of the better roses. You know, is the, is the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare sprint? No. But Estilo Talentoso came back and earned a 90. Byroness earned a 91. The fourth place finisher, who was well behind the top three, came back and earned an 84. So I think the 90 to 95 kind of buyer is accurate. As you can see, there's roughly that 20-point differential between the time form US rating that is not pace adjusted uh, and the buyer, the 93 to the 114 kind of checks out, makes you look at it and say, I think the figs are, are spot on. Given the way the race could set up, I think Lake Avenue is a little intriguing. I made her five to one. She's nine to two on the morning line. I think with the presence of some of these other fillies, she probably, I shouldn't say that she probably goes off in that ballpark because she could be a sneaky one. She's been bet basically her entire career. I, I would like to think there's a chance we get that four and a half to one or five to one on Lake Avenue. She's the one I'm most interested in. If you can get that price, if you get back into that three to one range, she doesn't do anything for me because she hasn't a, she doesn't have any edge on this field and B she really hasn't proven that she can run at this sort of distance. She, she debuted at six and that was it. So I, a little bit of uncharted territory here, but I think at the right price, I think she wins this race 17% of the time, five to one. You give me that nine to two, five to one. I think that's at least reasonable for Lake Avenue. The five truth hurts. She won the off the turf, perfect sting at Belmont park on 4th of July weekend. Longest price in a four horse field. Luis Saez jumps to the number six horse. Errat Ortiz Jr. Takes them out here just based on the paper. She's just too slow. Uh, if it rains, maybe you move her up but I would be surprised if she were to get the job done. I made her 49 to one from the 30 to one morning line. And I didn't even really take a note for that race because I, I, I'm going to go through and say, I just don't think she's good enough. I'm not going to waste my time trying to watch tape. And I remember the race because I was there. Um, it, it, good on them. I hope they, I, no will will. Wish them the best of luck. I just think it's a little bit of a, there would need to be many things working in their favor in order for her to win. A horse that is a little bit more intriguing, but still I think might be up against it is Don't Call Me Mary, who defeated Truth Hurts in her most recent start. That was an N2X at Belmont Park back on June the 11th. Career best buyer of 85 for Todd Pletcher. This is where Saez stays. He rode both the five and the six in the most recent start. He stays here. Uh, Saez is red hot right now. I think he's really doing everything brilliantly at Saratoga. Todd's barn is starting to heat up. I don't just because just because Todd and Chad got out of the gates a little bit on the slower side in week one, don't write them off. I saw many people, many people alluding to the fact that ah, until they win or until they run better, I'm out. I get it, but 
we're, we're talking about Todd and Chad. We're not talking about people that are, you know, four percenters. They're going to figure it out. They know what they're doing. Uh, I think Don't Call Me Mary is interesting. I think she ran best on the straightaway at Belmont Park. She was kind of pushed along. It didn't seem like she was really loving the turns. She eventually found her best stride on the straight. I thought it was a solid race. She's an interesting one. I think she does need the best race of her career if she's going to step with these girls. And that's part of the reason that I made her 19 to one in this spot. We move on to the number seven, Honey, I'm Good, another horse. This mare would really love it if the three, if the Sadie horse is out because she is a forwardly placed type. She's not absolutely one way sort of speedball needs to have it on the front, but she does her best when she's able to be forwardly placed for Steve Asmussen. I'm not sold that she's really of this caliber, but from a speed figure standpoint, uh, she would argue. And I think the best thing going for her, or one of them anyway, look at this record at six furlongs. She's never been out of the exacta. She has four victories from six lifetime starts at three quarters of a mile. She comes into this on the heels of a victory down at Monmouth Park on a muddy sealed track. Uh, look, I made her seven. Maybe I need to be a little bit more aggressive on her and, and bring her down into that sort of five to one range. But and maybe I will. Oh, I certainly will. If the other speed is gone, if the if the Rob Atris Philly is, is taken out, then, then Honey, I'm Good becomes much more live, I think, and I'd have to bring her price in. But for right now, I just kind of feel like I don't want to get too overzealous on a horse that I'm not totally convinced is really at the same level as some of the other girls that are in this race. Move on to the number eight, Miss Mosaic for Ben Colebrook. Nice, nice mare. Uh, running style wise, might be up against it a little bit. Uh, distance wise, I'm not convinced that six furlongs is really her game. I think she might be better going a little bit longer. Uh, but she ran into Bell's the one in the most recent start. And we'll talk about Bell's the one more mo uh, momentarily. I think Miss Mosaic is the kind of horse at a big price. Maybe you want to use her underneath. Uh, she's never encountered a wet track. It looks like there is a chance of weather on Wednesday. But Miss Mosaic, to me, is an underneath at best type. Having said that, from a speed figure standpoint, the two best races of her career are the two most recent, and they are the only two times she has tried dirt. And now we get to the big girl. This is the headliner. Bell's the one. She's just such a good, honest mare. She shows up and runs a race. She's never been beaten at six furlongs, a perfect four for four. She won the Rocks Atlanta most recently at Churchill Downs. The sixth place finisher in that field of six was the next out winner with an 84. She's well clear of that mare. The only concern you have with Bell's the one is the setup of the race. And going back to what we talked about at the top of the segment, the way six furlongs has played at Saratoga, it has been advantageous to be forward. Bell's the one is not a forward type. She was more forward in that Rock Solana. Keep in mind, I think she was taking on slightly weaker company. And it was at six and a half furlongs. At six furlongs, she's not shown that she is the kind that is going to be right up there pushing things. So six furlongs, a configuration that thus far may be a little bit uh, disadvantageous to showcase the running style that Bell's the one possesses. Having said that, she's way the horse to beat in here. I don't think I'm really telling you anything you don't know. Seven to five on the morning line. I could see her being in that even money range. She's probably the only legitimate grade one caliber mare in here. I guess Lake Avenue, there's an outside chance, but feel like eh, debatable. Bell's the one feels like the only absolute through and through grade one type that Breeders' Cup filly and mare sprint. She deserves to be and belongs in there. If she runs her race, she's probably going to get it done. I can't settle on a price that short. I made her two to one, and I'm well aware that she is very unlikely to approach that number. But for the reasons I've laid out, I, I'm more inclined to sit back and say, you know what, if she beats me at seven or eight to five or even shorter, so be it. I'm really not going to be too disappointed about it. Big picture, my hope is to bet Lake Avenue in here in that five to one range. Uh, it will be interesting to see what happens with the three Sadie rules, uh, because if she is withdrawn from this, um, excuse me, a uh, Sadie lady, uh, because if she's withdrawn from this race, the pace scenario, it's not nearly as swift. And that certainly, I think, would hurt a horse like Bell's the one. And if we're being honest, it would probably compromise a horse like Lake Avenue. But if I can get that five to one, I think Lake Avenue is at least 
worth considering from a win standpoint. I'm not sold that the six is going to work for her, but you know what? I, I think they're still trying to figure out what her game is at this point in her career. Uh, Lake Avenue for me in the Wednesday feature at Saratoga, that's the grade two honorable miss while acknowledging that the race goes through Bell's the one. Now time for the Friday feature at Saratoga race number nine. It is the curling stakes. These are three-year-olds. Uh, and I think it's a pretty good group going a mile and an eighth on the main track. If you want to be on the show next Monday, you need to leave your selection for the curling on Friday beneath the video player on YouTube. If you're correct, I'll contact you. We'll figure out some time to get together and make this thing happen. It's a race that I think you can go a few different ways in. I don't think there's an absolute slam dunk in here, despite the fact that first captain for Shug McGay, he really feels like he's going to, I think he's probably going to take quite a bit of money in here, um, due in large part to his victory in this year's Dwyer and the fact that he's a perfect three for three. He has earned nothing but 90 plus buyer speed figures in his career, but it's not as though he's taking on a group that doesn't have any kind of ability. And I think this race ties into that track profile piece we did at the top of the honorable miss piece. I think that kind of, maybe you want to factor that in for Friday's race. Just my opinion. Let's start down on the inside with Miles D, the number one. You'll note it's so early that we don't have a morning line or program numbers up as far as DRF formulator is concerned. Goes out for Chad Brown. This is a horse who most recently broke his maiden in his first start as a three-year-old. Did so rather emphatically. More than two lengths, 85 buyer, 106 time form U.S. rating. The only problem I had with the race was how early he was to change leads. Now, Belmont Park is a big track. Uh, and it's one turn at a mile. He's inexperienced. I don't want to totally go overboard and bash him too, too much, but I didn't love it. I don't think it's ever a good thing when they change leads early as opposed to late. Late is bad enough. Early is even worse. Having said that, again, he's inexperienced and he's in the best hands possible with Chad Brown. Now, you want to talk about some numbers. Chad Brown, past eight months, dirt route, maiden winner last out. 8 for 14, 12 in the money with a 377 ROI. The third place finisher in that maiden special weight on June the 12th came back and earned an 81 buyer in their next start. If anything, indicating that this fig, it's legit, but it may even be a little bit on the slow side. I'll be curious to see where Joel Rosario positions this son of Curlin because I don't think he's as fast as some of the other runners in here. Doesn't mean he can't be more forward, but I think it's just something to keep an eye on. Because if he's got too much work to do, first time going two turns against legitimately good company, not just great in stakes run, or not just stakes company, good company. It's first start against winners. I think it's a lot to ask for Miles D. I'm not saying he can't do it, but there are enough reasons for me. And to be honest, from a value line standpoint, I made him five to one. This to me is the best time to make a value line when you don't have morning line odds to whether. You're someone who easily gets swayed or you're someone who tries to just be stone cold. No matter what, seeing the morning line will influence the way you, you interpret things. It just will. Even for someone like myself, who I think I pride myself on saying that I, I don't really care what other people are thinking as far as what my ultimate decision is. I factor in other people's opinions, but my, my decision is going to be my decision no matter what. It, there is still that piece of just you know, that little psychological piece of seeing what the projected line could end up being that plays into your psyche a little bit. So to me, this is the best time to go through and make a value line because it is genuinely clear as it gets. There, there is nothing that can sort of influence your opinion of what the prices on these horses would need to be in order for you to make a win bet. So miles D for me, five to one for the reasons I alluded to. Snow House for Brad Cox. This is a horse who's paired up career buyer tops of 86. I think that can precede a forward move. We're talking about a lightly raced three-year-old son of twirling candy. Really done nothing wrong in four lifetime starts. I thought he was handled pretty easily by first captain, though, and I guess that's my concern. And let's just take a look at that, Dwyer, just to really emphasize how, well, a combination of things, how easily first captain defeated Snowhouse and what it means for Snow Captain. Now, this video is from the Naira YouTube channel. They typically upload all of their stakes action over there, so you can find this over there. 
in lovely high definition if you don't have access to replay somewhere else, which most of us do these days. I just don't want to get in trouble. So I take the ones that are up on YouTube. They're going to break from the gate. Snowhouse is the Judmont horse who's going to be sort of perched three wide right now. The yellow and red silks, which I think are very slick. I'm a big fan of red and yellow colors or red and white colors. Uh, toward the back of the pack, that is first cap. And he's two to five for Suge. He's, look, everybody kind of knew the deal here. All things considered, this is a pretty comfortable trip for Snowhouse. Going to get the jump on first captain out in the clear. Fractions aren't crazy. All things, you got to be pretty pleased with where you're at if you're backing this horse at three to one. The problem is first captain, who is not the, uh, let's say, most fleet of foot. When I watch him run, he just, to me, feels like the sort of horse that you need to really get into him before he's going to show you his best. And I, I know I was jumping around there on the replay. I'll let it run from here. Because Snowhouse, at this point, to me, is far and away the most likely winner. You see Jose Ortiz aboard first captain. He's actually showing him the stick now, saying, come on, bud, we got to get going. Riding with Biden ran quite well in this race. I was disappointed Snowhouse didn't get second from riding with Biden. But you see those two on the outside. Those are the two who we're going to be talking about for this race. The thing about first captain is I feel like he has that, when you watch him run, he feels like a Hulk, like he's just going to keep running. Like he's going to go a mile and a half, two miles, no problem. He's not the most electric as far as, you know, blowing the doors off people. He's also not the most electric as far as acceleration and things like that are concerned. But I think they could go around two more times and nobody would ever get close to him. I think first captain is the kind of horse that will run all day. Snowhouse, I don't know what his game is yet. It's too early to make a call one way or the other, I think anyway, based on what he's done. I do find it interesting that he's only gone two turns twice. They were the first two starts of his career. The first one came on grass. The second one was an off the turf race. Um, the one turn miles. I wonder if that's what you're going to be looking at with him long-term. Maybe he's going to be a one turn type, but again, far too early to really make a call one way or the other. He didn't run poorly in the Dwyer, but to me, he was no match for first captain. I made him nine to one in this race on Friday afternoon. Let's take a look at Harvard. Because Harvard, to me, is one of the more interesting runners in the race. And he's probably going to be the horse that I'll pick. And I'll hope to bet. And I think I'm going to get the price that I need on him. Let me run down the scenario for this horse. Uh, Rudolph Brissett, numbers aren't great at Saratoga in route races. Past five years, Saratoga routes over 21. Only five of them have hit the board. But when I look at this horse, I think there has been a pretty major development for two reasons. They stretched him out in distance, and they put blinkers on him. His two two-turn races on dirt have both been victories. They've both come in front-running fashion, which I don't think should go overlooked, and they've both come with blinkers. It's the way that he won the race at Churchill Downs on June 11th that kind of caught my attention and, and made me think, ooh, it, this might be a decent horse. He did it all with his ears just flopping around. And you can go through, if you have a, a subscription to any of these sort of streaming things, you can find the replays for Churchill Downs or on your ADW site. Um, I would encourage you to go back and watch that race because he really felt like, while it looks, well, it's not the sexiest running line, half length basically throughout. He never really looked like he was really in trouble. And I just like the way that he was moving. I like the way that he did it all around. I think the figure's legit. When you see the second and third place finishers now, keep it. This is also an interesting one that you need to make a call on. Second and third place finishers, Dak Daniels and Clay the Lionheart. Clayton the Lionheart. They both come back to earn 96 buyers in their next start. Sounds great. They both did it in the same race at Saratoga on July the 15th. It was race number seven. So the fig may be high in that race perhaps artificially, you know, pumping up that N1X that Harvard is going to come out of. It's too early to tell with the way that I saw Harvard run and the figs that the second and third place finishers came back to earn in their next start. I'm going to believe it. And I love, I love, love, love that Luis Saez has the mount on this horse because I, even though there is no confirmed, just absolute blazing speed in here, I don't think there are enough speed types that are going to be re relatively close. And I think Luis is the kind of rider, especially with the way the zone that he's in. I don't think he's going to get cute. I think he's going to go use this horse's speed. 
pedigree wise, I don't think it's gonna be a problem. The distance, even if he does have to use a little bit early on, you can see I've highlighted it down the bottom here. He's a full brother to classic empire. So I don't think the distance is going to be an issue for him. And maybe he's, a, maybe he needs the lead. I don't know. It's too early to, to say definitively one way or the other, his only wins have come while he's had the lead, but he his only wins have also come in his two turn route races with blinkers on. So I, you know, there are a lot of unknowns with a horse like this, but I think you're going to get a price. I think speed wise, he's right there as far as figures are concerned and running style wise. I love where I expect him to be positioned with the rider assigned. I'm going to pick Harvard in here and at five to one or better, I will be betting on him to win the curling first captain. We've already talked about it. He makes all the sense in the world. Speed figure wise, he ticks all the boxes. I'm going to be curious though. You see these first two races, he was pretty close to the front end. I don't know that he's going to be that close. Those were both glacial paces for one turn races at Belmont Park. And with just a slight bit more speed in the Dwyer, he was two and a half out of it early on. So I'm not sold that he's going to be up there pushing things. His damn America, if you'll remember, I liked her. She was, she was not flashy by any stretch. I have it written in their grinder. That's what she was. She was a horse that needed to be ridden. And she was, she was just a stayer. And I get the same sort of vibes. This one, though, may be more talented than mom was. Um, he just, he could be anything. And I think that's the most exciting thing about a horse like First Captain. However, from a gambling standpoint, I think he's going to be an underlay on Friday. He may go out there and win by 10. But at two to one or somewhere thereabouts, which I have a feeling he, he lands somewhere in that range. He's just, a, he's just an underlay to me. I made him seven to two. Uh, he can win. I would suggest using him if you're playing a pick or anything like that. Uh, but in the big picture, I want him to prove to me that he can do it going two turns against better horses at a short price in a race where he may be a little bit compromised from a running style standpoint. I also found that workout that I circled a little bit peculiar. Um, I get it. He's, he's never been one to really just go out there and, and throw it down. You got a couple of bullets on the page. Don't get me wrong, but his race, his works leading into his victories in the first three starts, uh, they were bullets. And for whatever reason, I didn't highlight this one, but a bullet 48 half uh, headed into the N1X victory. Wasn't a bullet, but it was a pretty decent 48 and three half uh, headed into his maiden win 48 and change half. Um, this is his last work leading into this race on Friday, uh, 52 and four. I don't know. It seems rather uh, leisurely to me. I know it's not necessarily how fast they do it. It's how they do it. But I mean, you could time that with a sundial. So we'll find out. First captain's most, arguably the most intriguing entrant in the entire race in a race littered with, in my opinion, pretty intriguing prospects. Um, but from a gambling standpoint, I think he's going to be an underlay. Baron, he, he may end up biting me in the rear end. I'm not sold that he's really a two-turn horse. It's one thing to beat PA breads on, on a sealed track when you're just better than everyone else. It's another thing to do it against what could be graded stakes types. I'm not convinced he's there. I appreciate the, taking a shot, and he figures to be forwardly placed, uh, but I'm just not buying it right now with Baron. I made him 32 to 1. Oh, and by the way, I made, I don't know if I said this, I made first captain 7 to 2. Collaborate was the one I had the, the most difficult time deciding what I wanted to do with simply because he's the sort of horse that look, I, I picked him in the Florida Derby and he was, he was, just wasn't good. He was wide throughout, not a great trip, but he never really threatened. He didn't fire. Then they turn him all the way back to six and a half and he loses at two to five. Not a great start. Then they get him back out to a one turn mile where I thought he was very, very impressive, breaking his maiden back in late February. And he does basically the exact same thing, except this time he's pocketed up, waiting, 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 eventually splits and blows the doors off the field, earns an 86 buyer. The runner-up came back and won his next start with an 83 buyer. I don't know what he is on, on a number of fronts. I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's this good. I don't know if he's a one-turn horse or a two-turn horse. Running style-wise, is he going to be up there pushing the pace or are there any concerns about how far he actually wants to go? I didn't think distance would be a problem for him. It's the reason I picked him in the Florida Derby. But for being honest, his two best races have been one-turn miles. So maybe that's what he is. Maybe he's a middle-distance one-turn type as opposed to a two-turn mile and an eighth or mile and a quarter classic type. Um, and when I say classic, classic distance. 
I don't know where he stacks up right now. I made him five to one, thought about picking him, but I was just much more intrigued by Harvard than I was collaborate. I uh, won't be surprised if he runs well, but he, I'm kind of in that prove it mind frame with this horse. And then toward the outside, you've got dynamic one. Dynamic one was, I thought the best horse in the wood, the much maligned wood and rightfully so race, not very good. Don't hold the Kentucky Derby against him. Just draw a line through that. If you think he improved at all from the Wood Memorial, where he did earn an 89 buyer and a 104 time form rating, there's at least a, a chance that he's a mid-90 type, and he does feel like he'll run all day. And that could potentially work to his advantage. The problem is he doesn't have any speed. I don't believe any way. The races he's been forward have had glacial paces. And that doesn't project to be the case in here. While there's no burners, I don't think they're going to be walking out there. So dynamic one, you get a rad, that's all well and good. I, I, and it's Todd off the bench with a three-year-old. He does this better than anyone. But I just, I, I want to see where he stacks up. I would hope that you get a good performance and then maybe we can parlay that into something for the Travers. But just in this spot right now, uh, I'm going to side against him. I made him six to one. I don't think he's totally impossible, but you can tell six to one, we're starting to make him a fringe contender. So while all eyes are going to be on first captain for Suge, and understandably so, uh, I think it's a more interesting race than just him and six others. I made first captain seven to two. The horse that I'm going to pick and I'm going to hopefully bet is the number three Harvard at five to one or better. If not outright on the lead throughout, pressing it and then hopefully taking over beneath Luis Saez. Let me know who you like in race number nine at Saratoga on Friday afternoon. It is the Friday feature. It's the $120,000 curling stakes for three-year-olds. Leave your selection beneath the video player on YouTube if you're correct. I'll contact you and we'll set something up for next Monday. There you have it. Some ideas for a couple of stakes races from the spa this week, along with the Friday feature that is the curling on Friday afternoon. However you listen to this thing, thank you for doing so. Many ways to find the podcast. Uh, audio only, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and themoneypodcast.com. If you're someone who watches along over on YouTube, search bar Matt Burner, your show, you'll get this episode along with the 74 prior. Until next Monday when episode 76 comes rolling along, uh, best of luck however you play, whatever you play, and wherever you play. This has been episode 75 of the Matt Burner, your show. Mm-hmm.